Well, good morning. If you haven't seen that movie, it's the story of I Can Only Imagine, and uh, it's a great, great movie, very inspiring and encouraging, and um, I, don't, I don't recommend movies very often, just so you know, if, you know, you guys, even if they're Christian movies, I'm like, man, it was okay, but um, I think I'm the worst critic and maybe in the church, but, um, and I like movies that nobody else likes, so I'm always afraid to recommend, <laughs> I'm like, that was a great movie, and people are like, mm, no. No, Pastor, that really was. But this one's really good. And, um, you know, one of the things about folks who've been abused or hurt as kids is to them, it's normal. And so sometimes they'll tell you a story about their childhood or something, and you go, what? what? And you realize how bad it is, and they don't. And they don't, because for them, it's what they're used to. But here's the thing. God has given you a past. You've had a past. And God can use that past, even the pain of your past, not just for you, but for you to be a blessing and even an encouragement to someone else. So last night I'm driving to church with my mom. We come out of the, we come out of the country over in the big city of Chuliota. Through, we pass Fort Christmas. You can hear banjos as you pass it. And... Uh, but anyway, we were going down the road, and all of a sudden, and I appreciate Joe bringing this, your dad, um, all of a sudden, we're going down the road, and there's been some posts up for a fence, and there's some guys out there uh, uh, putting in and stretching the fence, and they're using this, which was something I came across this week. I'm going to tie this in in a second, so just hang on. So this is called a come-along, if you didn't know that, and what it does is it makes the fence come along, right? And so, and so it stretches the fence, and, and it was funny because, and now my mom was funny because she told my son, I didn't say that, but she did say it, and if she's watching this morning, she said it. She says to me, as we pass it, maybe one day you'll do that to our fence. <laughs> Thanks, mom. My heart. But, um, yeah, anyway, so, um, yeah, but you should see our fence. It's bad. It's, I just, like, threw it. I'm like, yeah, there's a fence. The dogs can't get out, and it's, the deer can get in, and it, but whatever. And anyway, but a come along, what does it do? It makes a fence stretch farther than it would otherwise, right? And that's the idea of encouragement. And even biblically, here's what's really cool. So we, we call the Holy Spirit the paraclete, but the word for encouragement is very similar. Uh, 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 it's parakleto. And the idea of it is of somebody who comes alongside, somebody who encourages you, somebody who is walking with you through life. And so as we talk about encouragement today, I want you to think about this idea of a come along. And who in your life just needs a little pull? Who in your life has God put in your life and you're supposed to help them, uh, not hinder them, by the way. We've all had that friend too. They're like the opposite. I don't know what you would call that, the leave alone. I don't know. Come along, to leave alone. Uh, but the Holy Spirit in us is the one who encourages us, who comes alongside of us. And then God's called us to be encouragers, to help others to go farther, to walk through things that are difficult. Um, some of you this morning, I just know life is just hard sometimes. So uh, in a group this size and with folks watching online, I know there's folks who are going through difficulty and going through struggle. And I want you to know, don't feel like you have to do that alone. But also know that there's other people who are here to help you. But also, even in the middle of your difficulty, God may even use you, even during your difficulty, to be a blessing and to encourage someone else. So let me ask you this. Do you have a desire to make a difference in the world? Is there a desire in your heart to do something that matters for God? Because... As we're going to talk about encouragement today, encouragement is one of those things where very simple acts of encouragement can add value to other people and make a huge difference in their life. And we're going to look at Paul and his relationship to Timothy. Typically, when we think about encouragement, we think about Paul and Barnabas, because Bar Barnabas literally is the son of encouragement. 
But Timothy was also a huge encouragement, not just to Paul, but to the early church. And we're going to kind of look at that idea and see not only what Paul says about this idea of encouragement, which this word is used all through here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, but the idea that not only do they do that, it's a demonstration to us of this idea of connecting with others, focusing on blessings, and then praying for others. Okay, so number one we're going to talk about today, intentionally connect with others. Now, why do I say intentionally connect with others? Because we live in a world, if we're not careful, we will look like this all the time. More and more, we are isolating ourselves. And so you have to be intentional about connecting with others, which means that for some of you, you don't even know your neighbors. You've never met them. You try to run inside before you see them. If you see them, you don't go to your mailbox, right? And so you have to intentionally go out of your way for the person in the next cubicle, for the person that's next door, for a family member who you've not visited with in a while. You have to intentionally go out of your way. One of the things I love that my uh, daughter does is she has a lockbox. You ready for this? She has a timed lockbox for her phone. So she will put her phone in this lockbox for two hours, and it's always when I text her that it's in there, or at least that's what I'm told, right? But, but the truth is, why does she do that? She does it because she recognizes I need some time to force my phone to be away from me because, listen, kids today grew up all the time with this technology. Uh, uh, with those things. Now, I had the first PDA, I had the first cell phone, I had the first uh, uh, video game on a little handheld Coleco thing, you know, I had the Atari. So, so we started that. Kids today are carrying that in their pocket all the time. And so we have to intentionally connect with others. But even if you don't have the excuse of your phone, you have to go out of your way to connect with people. And here's the thing. When we're tired, when we're discouraged, sometimes we don't want to connect with people. So let's, let's look at what Paul says here. First Thessalonians, uh, we're picking up in chapter 3, and we're going to talk about chapter 3 all day today. And we're going to go 1 through 5. Here we go. So when I could stand it no longer, I love it. It sounds like Popeye to me, i got to say. Stands it no longer. Can't stand it no more. Uh, when, oh, that was a terrible Popeye. But anyway... The only one I do well with Popeye is, I'll give oil. So there you go. All right. So when I could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. All right. So what did he do? It says, we sent Timothy, I love this, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. So what was, Paul, what was Timothy going to do? He was going to strengthen them and encourage them in their faith. And see, we don't often think of Timothy as the encourager, but here's what Paul says. Paul says, let's send him to you. Now remember, let me go back just a second. I'll, I'll get there in a second. So that no one would be unsettled by these trials. By the way, I have to say this. It, it's really a useless Greek word. It, it, it means unsettled. But it's a fun one. This word for unsettled means a dog tail, literally a dog's tail wagging. And that's the most unsettled thing. I know you have a new do jo uh, dog, Steve. Is that tail pretty unsettled? Yeah, all the time, right? And so, so unsettled. So it's the idea that all of a sudden everything shakes, everything's loose, right? And then it says, by these trials, for you know quite well that we were destined for them. That doesn't sound like a TV preacher, does it? I mean, a TV preacher would probably say to this guy, you, Paul, that's a negative confession. You know, by you saying that, now it's going to happen. Paul's just telling the truth. By the way, don't mix up being a person of faith and being an honest person. You know, uh, uh, you know people say, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Praise Jesus. Didn't you have like the worst week you've ever had? Well, I'll just say I'm blessed. Okay, that's better, right? I'm above ground, right? That's a good, you know, somewhere, right? And so, for I know we destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand get no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. 
And I'm going to talk about that in a second. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and our labors might have been in vain or empty. And so here's the idea. Remember, Paul was chased out of Thessalonica by people who were criticizing him and attacked him. And he was basically chased out of town. And then the very people who chased him out of town said, well, see, why is Paul leaving in such a hurry? It's like, why are you hitting yourself? You know, it's like, what? And... And so the very people who chased Paul out of town are now critical of him. They said, oh, he was just in town to make money. He was just in town to do... And it said all kinds of things. So Paul was concerned because he was only in town a few weeks. He shared the gospel with them. Many came to Christ. And now he's thinking, I wonder how they're doing. I mean, we, we didn't even get to talk to them a long time. Are they growing in their faith? What's happening to them? So he sends Timothy thinking, you know, maybe they need some encouragement. Maybe Timothy will be able to bring them God's word. And he was worried. Why? Because he thought that maybe the seeds they planted were choked, you know, like the parable of the seeds where you throw them on different ground. He was afraid, hey, maybe some of those seeds, weeds came up. Those mean people who chased us out of town are now attacking those other people. And so Paul's saying, hey, you know, we were attacked. You know, we've, we've gone through trials. And he's relating to them. Do you realize how important relationships are? Paul loves Timothy so much and he enjoys his time with Timothy. And of course, when the times he's in jail, he needs Timothy's help. He probably has vision issues where he literally needs Timothy around. And yet he says, the church needs Timothy more. So I'm sending him there. All of us have an opportunity every day whether we're going to withdraw from people or whether we're going to build relationships. Over the years, I've talked to a lot of people who've worked out at the Space Center and worked different places, and I've asked this question I don't even know how many times now. I just enjoy asking it, and I still ask it sometimes. I say, would you rather work alone or work with other people on a project? And almost every time, you know what people say, right? Alone. Why? So the Native Americans had a saying, and I, and I think it's perfect for Christians. It is, we go faster alone and farther with others. And that's the same thing for encouragement. You can't encourage by yourself. Yes, the Holy Spirit can encourage you, but the truth is sometimes we need somebody else to what? To come alongside of us. And by the way, if you're not in a position right now where you need someone to come alongside of you, guess what? God's put you in a position to maybe come alongside somebody else and help them as they walk through a difficulty, through a trial, through a struggle. I love what Paul says about Timothy, and this isn't on, the, this isn't on your screen, but it says, Paul in, in Philippians chapter 2 says, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. He looks at Timothy and he says, Timothy cares for people. He's unselfish. He's grateful. In 2 Corinthians 13, Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restorations, encourage, that's that word again, parakaleo, there it is again, this idea of coming alongside, pulling somebody along, one another. Be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Wouldn't it be awesome in our world if Jesus' prayer would be answered that he prayed for us? That people would notice our love for one another. That when people got around Christians, they'd be like, something's very different about them. And it wouldn't be, something's very different about them. But it would be, there's, there's a love for people. They really care about people. People matter to them. And Paul is, is basically pouring that out here. In this chapter, he's saying, hey, I care about, I'm going to send Timothy to see what's going on. And then here's what Timothy comes back with, and he comes back with a report. And so number two is not only intentionally connect with others, number two is focus on your blessings. I don't care where you are in life, you've got wonderful things happening and terrible things happening, most likely at the same time. I told somebody on the way home, my daughter decided to throw up on me last night. What a joy. 
That wasn't the joyful part, right? Anybody think that was the happy part? No, that was the miserable part. I open the door so I can hear her. So I open the door and she doesn't make it. She makes it to me. Yeah, that's fun, huh? How do you like that for a morning story on a time change week, right? So, so here's the truth for all of us. We can choose what to focus on and what really matters. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. And I challenge the kids to do it. And I'm challenging you to do it too. I moved my own picture and didn't know where I put it. I want you to begin to think of a picture of how you can be a blessing. Kristen and I went to Seattle just a few years ago to visit our daughter. And when we were there, it was really hot. It was like 103. It was actually hotter in Seattle, Washington than it was in Florida. We had to come back to Florida to cool off, if that tells you how bad it was. And so... But we were there, and we went to the ocean one day, to, and it was amazing, because here we don't have cliffs. There was a cliff on the ocean. It was just beautiful. We went to this little park, and as we're walking around this park, we walked to the top of this hill, and at the top of this hill, uh, over a cliff overlooking the water where whales sometimes come through. Of course, I never saw a whale, but I was looking. There's a picnic table up there. And at that picnic table are two 80-something-year-old people. And they're sitting there with each other. And I thought, what are they doing? And they're playing a board game. Somebody's cross is up here. They're playing a board game. Oh, cheers. Okay. They're playing a board game. And I thought, I said to Kristen, that's life goals right there. Now, I don't know if they were playing sorry and he got mad at her and threw the board and walked off and they didn't talk anymore. But it was amazing to me. And so, of course, I had to say, where are y'all from? They said, oh, we live just down the road, and it's so hot today, we wanted to come out here and play a board game. And I said, Kristen, that is life goals for us. So when I think of pictures in my head of encouragement of something I want to see God do, that's one of them. I want to be 80-something years old, sitting on the beach, playing a board game. Okay, maybe not a board game, but something, right? Right? And, and relating to each other and being in a relationship, I was just blown away because it was such a special time. I felt like we had interrupted this special time. And it was amazing. And I said, that's a picture. So what's a picture? Maybe there's somebody in your life who's blessed you over the years. Maybe you can remember a time that somebody encouraged you. Get that as a picture in your mind and say to God, God, would you help me to accomplish that? Paul goes on, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He told us that you always have, now here's the picture, pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were, and here's the word again, encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you're standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return, listen to this, for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you. Paul says, I see this picture. Timothy has brought me back this picture of what God is doing in your lives. And I'm so encouraged. Now, I don't know what's going on in your life that's imperfect. I don't know what struggle's going on. And if you're not careful, you'll focus on that picture, that difficulty, that struggle. Can I tell you that even in the middle of jail, even in the middle of a, a, a captivity, that Paul is able to look at this picture and say, I have joy as I think about you. So I don't know what you're walking through today, but my prayer is that you would have a picture of what God wants to do with you. Or maybe something that God has blessed you with. Maybe it's a past picture that you want to see God do again. And then he says, night and day, we pray most earnestly, what? That we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. In 2 Timothy, Paul talks to Timothy, and I read this to the kids earlier, part of it. I thank God who I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day. I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so I may be filled with joy. And then he says this. Here's the picture he remembers. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. 
and I am persuaded now lives in you. So what does he do? Paul's now handing a picture to Timothy. You know what, Timothy? I remember your mother and grandmother. Do you see them? Do you see the faith? Who in your life has been a person of faith that you can get a picture of? That when you're struggling, you can think of that person and say, God, thank you for the faith. Maybe it's a mother. Maybe it's a grandmother. Maybe it's a friend. Harold Brantley was my mentor for years. And I, I remember over and over him saying to me, Eric, don't worry about your enemies. You just keep doing what God called you to do. He'll take care of your enemies. So who is it that God's put in your life that's that picture? And I want you to begin to say, God, would you give me that picture of that person of faith that I can be obedient to what you've called me to do? Chuck Swindoll says this, I can't even imagine where I would be today if it were not for a handful of friends who've given me a heart full of joy. Let's face it, friends make life a lot more fun. You know, it's the two commands are love God and love people. The hard part's the people. Right? And the truth is, if you have friends, you're going to have to be a forgiver. Because your friends are not perfect. Your pastor's not perfect. You know, I talk about it all the time. People come to my group, they come the first week, oh, gosh, Pastor Eric, he's so great. Three weeks in, they're thinking, who made him the pastor of this church? You people really need to... Number three. So not only do we intentionally connect with others, not only do we focus on our blessings, here's probably the most important thing. Pray for others. Pray for others. People are coming in for the 9 o'clock service. I think it's really funny. Anyway, okay. Pray for others. Now, have you ever, how many of you have ever been on a treadmill? Yeah, some of you are like, when I went to the doctor's office. Okay, so, this is true. So, on a treadmill, right? You're on a treadmill, and then what do you do? You hit resistance, and the treadmill goes steeper and steeper, and the whole idea of resistance is to make you stronger, or in a doctor's visit, to make you huff and puff so they can see what's going on with you. But either way, right? You crank up the resistance, and you get stronger. Here's the thing. The things that you have been through, the difficulty you've had in life, God can use that very difficulty to help you, number one, to pray for others. But number two, as you pray, to say, God, would you show me some way that I can be involved in helping? Maybe for some people, it's that you share your story with them. Maybe for some people, it means you know what it's like to go through that difficulty and you look for ways to help them like somebody helped you as you went through it. That's why we pray for others. Paul says this, Now may our God and Father himself, our Lord Jesus, clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase. And this word for increase is kind of cool. It means abundant. It's the idea of overflowing love. It's, it's the same word that was used about the picking up of the extra baskets after the miracle. It's this idea of all kind of extra stuff. An overflow, that's where the basket word is right there. An overflow for each other and for everyone else just as our, ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with his Holy One. Now, if you think that was just Paul praying that, in the early church, Acts chapter 12, it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And the church's prayers were so powerful that God came and rescued Peter from prison. And here's a really awesome part. And then Peter goes to the door of the church, knocks on the door. They don't let him in. And then when the girl who's at the door, Rhoda, says, says to the church, hey, Peter's here, they say, you're out of your mind. He's not here. I mean, that's how little faith they had. That's why Jesus says to us, it's the faith of a mustard seed. So the next time you pray for somebody, I want to encourage you. Don't feel like you have to be strong enough or smart enough. Just begin praying for them. And as you're praying for them, also feel free to say, and God, would you show me anything you want me to do? Because it could just be that you send somebody a text at just the right time. It could be that you write them a note. It could be that you show up at their house and encourage them. It could be that you bring them a snack. It could be that you bring them some soup. Whatever it is that God puts on your heart, just pray and say, God, would you reveal to me what you want me to do? And then follow through with it. This week, I got a note from somebody who said, hey, I've heard you were sick this week. I just want you to know I was praying for you. 
And then I realized who it was from. And the person writing to me is in the hospital. So Trudy Black is in the hospital, and I want us to pray for her as a church. But, but she's in the hospital, and yet she's writing to me going, Hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Listen, I don't know what you're going through today. But even in the middle of your struggle and your difficulty, I want to encourage you to do these things. Encourage and to go out of the way. Connect with people on purpose. Go out of your way to count your blessings in the middle of your difficulty and then pray for others, even in the middle of trial. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means that Jesus died for you and rose again so you can surrender your heart to him today. Repent of sin, say, Jesus, I'm messed up, I'm broken, and I surrender my life to you. And today you can become a brand new creature in Christ as you surrender your way to his way and follow him. If you want to do that, I'll be here after the service. I'd love to pray with you, talk to you about what that means. If you're here today and you're a Christian, the truth is maybe you're struggling with encouragement. Maybe you know somebody, as I talked, you thought, I need to reach out to so-and-so. Just make a commitment to do that and ask God to give you the strength to do that. Let's close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word, your strength, your power, your love. Lord, I thank you for all the encouragers in our church. I thank you for people like Rodney. I thank you for people like Steve and others in our church that go out of their way to help people to come along to do what you've called them to do. Lord, may we continue to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.